Hello everyone, my name is Vikas Mishra and I'm a third year PhD student at Indri Alil. Today I'll be uh, presenting my paper titled uh, Deja Vu, Abusing Browser Cache Headers to Identify and Track Online Users. This paper was done in collaboration with my colleagues Pierre, Walter and Ruma. To give an overview of the presentation, I'll start by giving a short intro to Browser Cache, then present our attack along with its empirical evaluation and talk about the privacy implications of our attack. Finally, I'll propose a few differences and then conclude the presentation. All the modern browsers employ browser caches to optimize page loads and reduce network load by saving a local copy of static and infrequently changed resources. Websites use expires and cache control headers to instruct the browsers on how to handle their caches. Expires HTTP header is a pre-HTTP 1.1 header and simply denotes the expiry date in future in the GMT format. Cache control header was introduced in HTTP 1.1 and it was meant to replace expires header as it gives the website owners much more fine-grained control using its various directives such as MaxH. So here is a sample response header for an image. Whenever a client makes a request to the web server for an image, this is what the web server returns in forms of the header. We can see the headers include access control allow origin, expose header, uh, content type says it's an image, it also has a date header which shows the time when the resource was requested. Furthermore, it has an expires header, so the resource here is set to expire at some future date. Now if we could just read this date header, we'll know when the resource was requested by the client. There is a method called get all response headers, which returns us a list of all response headers for a resource. But here's the issue. Since we want to learn when a user visited a website, these resources are all cross-origin, hence we need to make cross-origin requests. Now, browsers have a, a security mechanism called the same origin policy, which protects against cross origin vulnerability. However, there are legitimate reasons to make cross origin requests, uh, such as for third party analytics, fonts, etc. Hence, CORS exists as a relaxation of uh, same origin policy. CORS allows a resource from one origin to interact in the context of a different origin. Furthermore, browsers rely on access control origin header to decide if the res uh, response can be shared with the requesting code. When the value of this header is, uh, is set to a wildcard uh, star, it tells the browsers to allow requesting code from any origin to access this resource. So now we just need to find resources which have access control allow origin set to star, and we should have access to the date value, correct? Well, not really, since the date header is not course safe listed, which means that the browser mm, will filter it out when processing a course response. So we need to find some other way to extract the value of the date header as we do not have access to it. Notice that cache control and expires headers are safe listed, which forms the basis of our attack. Let's just have a look at the response headers of the same resource as before, but this time we request it multiple times uh, after clearing the cache. So once we request this uh, uh, resource after 5 minutes, then we clear the cache, then we request the same resource again after 10 minutes. Do you see the pattern? The date and expires headers always have a difference of 24 hours in this case. So if we know the value of the expires header, we can simply subtract 24 hours from it and get the value of the date header, right? That's the attack in a nutshell. We find resources which show this pattern where cache and the date headers are consistent with respect to time. So this uh, uh, picture gives a very simple overview of uh, how our attack looks like. A victim is led to a controlled web page, uh, that is step one. That will make a request to, make, uh, to one or more online resources in step two. These resources are hosted either on the attacker's domain or an external one. The attacker server then collects specific HTTP headers, namely cache control and expires, from the victim to calculate the times when each resource was cached in the browser. And then these time could be used to instrument attacks, which we will talk about later in the presentation. So let's talk about why this attack works. So browsers employ many security mechanisms such as uh, SOP, CSP or CORS to control with precision what can be loaded and executed in the browser. Despite these mechanisms in place, it is still possible to learn the exact time when a resource was cached. These are the three insight which makes our attack possible. The first one is browser caches are single keyed. Expires and cache controlled response headers are safe listed. Date header is not. Response headers are also cached along with the resource. When course processes response headers, it filters many sensitive headers and does not allow a course script access to these headers like date. Let's talk about date value extraction now. So servers use one of the two following behaviors to manage the freshness of the resources. They either used fixed expiry date or fixed expiry duration. 
let's talk about fixed expiry date so if you look at this uh, uh, example here uh, these two requests were made uh, one minute apart by two users uh, we can see from the uh, example the difference of 60 seconds between the two requests is directly reflected in the maxis directive for user 2 assuming that users do not all visit the website at the exact same second it is possible to rely on maxis to differentiate users once the attacker knows about the fixed expiry date of a particular resource they can calculate the time when a resource was cached by using this uh, equation so in this case uh, uh, all the resources expire at the exact same date for all users and the cache control max age header is dynamically calculated so once we know the fixed expiry date we can uh, subtract the cache control max age to get the date the other technique which the websites use is called fixed expiry duration uh, in, in this technique the resources expire in a fixed amount of seconds for every user expires headers is unique for each request so in this example both users have the exact same max age header and they each have a unique expires header so uh, for tracking purposes getting the unique expires headers may be sufficient but if the attacker wants to know when the resource was put in the cache to build a behavioral profile of the user she can use the following formula so now we know how to extract the date from uh, from a resource but before conducting the attack it is necessary to identify online resources that can be fetched or probed from any domain and either have a fixed expiry date or a fixed expiry duration thus we need to identify the resources which follow some rules and uh, we call that vulnerable resource identification so to identify them we perform two crawls of the same websites at different times t1 and t2 and collect the response headers of all images, CSS and JavaScript files requested on the page. This slide shows the simple algorithm we use to detect servers with the vulnerable configurations. It should be noted that in order to conduct this attack over a long period of time, an attacker must perform regular crawls to maintain a list of vulnerable resources. In the paper, we also present an empirical evaluation of our attack and uh, we performed a crawl of top 100,000 websites from Tranco List. Not only did we visit the homepage of these websites, but also five subpages. And uh, we instrumented this crawl using a uh, headless Chrome instrumented with Puppeteer. We were able to crawl about 393,000 web, web pages uh, on 78,000 websites on 2nd of June 2020, and uh, about 391,000 web pages on 78,623 websites on the 3rd June 2020. So both these crawls were made um, 24 hours apart from each other. So we, uh, after these crawls, we were able to collect about uh, 12.6 million resources uh, uh, from the crawl on 2nd June and about 12.5 million resources on the, uh, from a crawl on 3rd of, uh, June 2020. So uh, from both these crawls, we look at the common resources uh, because, some of, uh, because we can see that the numbers on 2nd June and 3rd June do not match. This could be because of several reasons, such as the page does not exist anymore or the resource does not exist anymore. So we only uh, look at the resources which are common between both the crawls. Uh, so on, on both the days uh, uh, from a crawl, about uh, 76,000 web websites were common. Uh, from those websites, about 382 uh, web pages were common and about 10.6 million resources were found to be common in both the crawls. From these 10.6 million resources, uh, only about 3.1 million resources were distinct because many of those resources were present in multiple websites. So in our dataset, we found that many resources were present in multiple pages and websites. So we analyzed the resources to figure out how many of them were shared with other websites. For instance, the table shows that about 21 resources were seen in more than 1,000 websites. All of these 21 resources can be categorized as analytics. These resources include fbevents.js, Google Analytics script, add this widget, ads by Google, and etc. Uh, interestingly, Google Anal Analytics was the most commonly used resource and it was present in about 18,000 websites in our dataset. Once we have a dataset of uh, resources, we perform some analysis uh, on these resources to figure out how many of them were vulnerable to our attack. So this table presents uh, a number of resources which followed a specific rule. For example, about 600,000 resources had access control allow origin set to star. So as I presented uh, uh, earlier in the, in the slides, uh, uh, we used the same algorithm. We found that about 91,000 uh, resources were vulnerable to our attack. Interesting thing to note from here is that our dataset has about 1.5 million resources that have the expires header. This shows the extent of the usage of the expires header, even though it has been deprecated and replaced by the cache control max directive. 
To better compare which resources are more vulnerable to our attack, we defined a metric called vulnerability window. It denotes the amount of time until which our probing script can detect the presence of a cache resource. This is the same as the duration for which a resource is cached in the browser. In this figure, we plot a CDF of the vulnerability windows of vulnerable JS, CSS, and image resources in our dataset. The x-axis has a log scale and the first dotted vertical line depicts 7 days while the second one depicts 30 days. From the figure, we can see that uh, about 30% of vulnerable images, 35% of vulnerable JavaScripts, and 30% of vulnerable CSS resources have a VW greater than 100 days. Which means that if a user visits a website that leads to uh, one of these resources being cached, they might remain cached for at least the next 100 days. We believe the vulnerability windows uh, depend on the use case of the resources. For instance, looking at image resources, nearly 65% of them have a vulnerability window less than 30 days and 30% of them have a vulnerability window greater than 100 days, which means that there are only about 5% of vulnerable images which have a vulnerability window between 30 days and 100 days. The reason being there are some images which are specific to a page or are part of a dynam dynamic page. For example, an image of a politician on news website's uh, front page on a given day. Whereas there are some images which are shared by other pages of the website and are expected to remain unchanged for longer duration. For example, the logo of the website. For images that are present on all pages, it makes sense for the servers to fix a long expiry date. Whereas the website does not want to take up space in the browser cache for too long for resources which are specific to a page or are part of a dynamic page. Thus, we believe that images that have a vulnerability window of greater than 30 days are those which are mostly site-wide resources such as logo. We also did a performance evaluation of the attack across multiple environments and present the results in this table. Apart from WebKit-based browsers where our attack does not succeed because uh, it already has cache isolation by default, the attack succeeds in all other major browsers on mobile and desktop such as Chrome, Firefox, Brave, and even Tor browser. In a sense, an attacker could feasibly check thousands of resources under, in under 30 seconds without having any noticeable impact on the device or the web page performance. Another important point to note here is that our probing script can be instrumented with either head or get queries to test whether a resource is in cache or not, and head queries are much faster than get queries and are significantly less impacted by the network speed. We also look at the privacy implications of our attack by giving two examples of how our attack could be used. The first one being history sniffing, which simply means illegal access of browser history through probing. Some of the popular techniques include CSS selectors and cache-based attacks. However, there are two key differences between our attack and the previously known attacks. Unlike our attack, which does not rely on any timing measurement, all of the previous cache-based history sniffing attacks can be classified as timing attacks, where the attacks rely on the difference in the time it takes to download the resource from the service directly or using a cached copy. This makes our attack immune to various defenses in modern browsers such as lower resolution and jitters in browser timers. The second difference being that our method succeeds in extracting the ex exact time when a resource was cached, unlike other history sniffing attacks which can only learn if a resource is cached or not. This presents some serious privacy implications as this information can be leveraged to build a timeline of the user's visit. We can learn if a visit to a particular domain was just a one-off or if it was repeated and part of the user daily routine, showing a keen interest to the topics discussed on the website pages. This information can also be abused to better target the user and understand her preferred time for reading news, watching videos or shopping. All in all, knowing if a page was visited is already concerning, but knowing exactly when adds an additional layer of intrusiveness that has not been seen before in more traditional sniffing. We also look at the uh, vulnerable websites in our, in our dataset and since not all vulnerable resources can be associated with individual websites as there could be some resources which are shared by multiple websites. So from our data set, about 87,000 uh, resources were presented on only one website. That means that each of these uh, resources could be uh, associated with a single website. About 8,456 websites can be probed with just one resource. And uh, we also look at the uh, ranking of these uh, vulnerable websites and uh, uh, our results show that the vulnerable websites are somewhat evenly distributed in the Tranco ranking. Popular websites are also vulnerable and the popularity of a website does not appear to have a huge impact on its vulnerability to our attack. Uh, not only did we look at the vulnerable websites but also vulnerable subpages. 
in our data set about 9000 sub pages belonging to 5574 websites have at least one vulnerable resource unique to them blogs news provides article based sites are the major chunks in these sub pages since these are the websites which uh, tend to have much more unique content in these pages uh, such as uh, image uh, linked to uh, a particular article video attached to a, uh, to a blog this uh, leads to behavioral detection because uh, we can detect a particular articles read by the user uh, which could lead to uh, their political leanings, their sexual orientation, their financial leanings and etc. We also uh, did a case study on news websites. So this case study demonstrates feasibility of attack on news websites. So we merely visited uh, five popular news websites namely MSN, CNN, CNBC, NBC News and MSNBC. Uh, all of these websites are uh, very highly ranked on uh, Tranco list and uh, we visited all these websites on uh, manually on uh, 31st of August 2020. Each website has pages with unique images so all these websites had news articles and whenever you visit those news articles um, all of these websites all of these news articles had at least one unique image and all th and these unique images uh, when they were cached in the browser their vulnerability window ranged from one hour for CNN.com to about 90 days for NBCNews.com. So this case study highlights the seriousness of the attack because this attack can be used to uh, extract what articles somebody read on these five popular websites. Another use case of our attack is user tracking. So user tracking basically means you create identif a unique identifier for a user and you can use the identifier to track user visits on multiple websites. So identifier is created by combining the times when uh, specific resources were cached in the user's browser. So 91,755 vulnerable resources which we found in our dataset, they can be used in different combinations to uh, build a unique combination for each user. However, this uh, uh, is difficult to scale for high traffic websites because multiple users visit the website on the sa at the exact same time Hence, complex algorithms are required to pick different combinations of vul vulnerable resources. We also talk about some possible defenses in the paper. The first one being uh, cache isolation and double keyed caches. So this is the simplest uh, defense and it has already been implemented uh, in browsers such as Safari. Double keyed cache uh, basically means including the URL of the resource and domain on which the request was made. So instead of just keying it with the domain on which the request was made, we also include the URL of the resource. Safari is already using this ETLD plus one of the top level document as a second key since 2013 and hence this is the reason our attack does not succeed on uh, Safari. Triple keyed approach is also possible where subframe attacks could be prevented by using the frame on which the request was made. However, uh, partitioning limits the reusability of third party resources and it has um, some performance uh, degradation as uh, shown by experiments by the Google Chrome team. Overall network load increased by about 3% cache misses increased by about 2%. Finally, to conclude, in this paper, we presented a novel cache attack, which is not based on timing measurements and showed that caching headers can be used to sniff browsing history. All major browsers except Safari were found to be vulnerable and about 12,000 websites from Tranco 100K websites are susceptible to our attack. In the end, we believe that our attack has serious privacy implications and major browser vendors need to roll out defense against this attack as soon as possible. Thank you and I'm now open to your questions.